Thank you very much, um, and lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for asking me to come and speak. Um, before I start, I should say probably at least two things. And the first thing I should say is that I'm not a diabetic neuropathy specialist. This is not my area. But just like you, I will frequently see people with diabetes and neuropathy, and I think it's a very important area. The second thing to say is that in contrast to the last two talks, which have been fantastic and have included lots of new drugs, lots of effective drugs in large randomized controlled trials with hard outcomes. I'm afraid neuropathy is much less well researched and actually it's much less clear what the best approach is or how we best support people living with diabetes and neuropathy. We use clinical screening, not a diagnostic test. Neuropathy has no direct impact on mortality, unlike renal disease and cardiovascular disease. We have no specific drugs for neuropathy alone. All of the drugs that we use are orphaned from other indications. We have no new drugs recently for diabetic neuropathy. And the studies that we have are small with mixed outcomes. They're heterogeneous, and it makes it very difficult for us to know how best to support people. Despite that, People with painful neuropathy live every day with neuropathic pain, which can feel horrible. There's a risk of foot ulceration and amputation and all the mortality that's associated with that. But it's the quality of life that I think we're really trying to concentrate on for diabetic neuropathy. And that has a huge impact on psychology and mood and how people can or can't work, how they can undertake daily activities, and the effects on them and their families. So um, I say all this at the start before I've even moved the slide on once um, because I think it's important to situate what I'm going to say with the two talks before which have made me slightly anxious that I'm not really going to give you very much data, I'm afraid. But hopefully I'll give you a refresher and a reminder of diabetic neuropathy um, and I'll give some time at the end for discussion and questions um, and you can tell me um, what you might do differently because I don't think there are necessarily answers here um, but there are certainly opinions and views. These are my declarations of interest. So I'll talk very briefly about epidemiology. I'll talk about pharmacological and non-pharmacological approaches to neuropathy. And if there's time at the end, I will talk uh, about the multidisciplinary team and I'll give you a personal anecdote um, of someone that I know at home, which, which I think is a nice way of thinking about pain. So one of the problems with the epidemiology of all neuropathy is that definitions of neuropathy vary. So if we want to know how many people in the general population live with any form of neuropathy, the first thing that we have to do is define what we mean by neuropathy. But the studies are so varied that estimates are from below 10% to around 50% of the general population living with neuropathy. And the study designs include uh, robust interventional diagnostics such as nerve conduction studies, questionnaire studies, and there is one study that resulted in a, in a prevalence of neuropathy close to 50%, which was literally knocking on people's doors and asking 10 questions. So I can't tell you how many people in the general population live with neuropathy, and I certainly can't tell you how many people with diabetes live with neuropathy. But what I can tell you is that over 50% of peripheral neuropathy is attributable at least in part to diabetes. And I'll come back to the mechanism for that. The incidence, so the occurrence of new neuropathy, is greater in people living with type 2 diabetes than it is in people living with type 1 diabetes. Something that I find quite surprising where we think of microvascular glucose-mediated complications has greater incidence in type 1 diabetes is not necessarily true, and you're much more likely to develop new neuropathy living with type 2 diabetes than with type 1. The additional duration of type 1 diabetes, though, means that the prevalence of neuropathy is essentially the same in both types of diabetes. So if you take a sample of people with type 1 and a sample of people with type 2, the prevalence is the same. And as I said, that really reflects the fact that neuropathy is partly and perhaps majoritarily a function of your diabetes duration. 
So what are the other risk factors? Well, as I said, the major determinants are HbA1c or glucose exposure itself and diabetes duration, but there are other associated factors with de developing neuropathy. We mustn't forget intensive management of hypertension, and that's not just for cardiovascular and hypertensive reasons, but it's also associated with development of neuropathies and, of course, retinopathy. Insulin resistance and the features of the metabolic syndrome, so raised triglyceride, insulin resistance, are associated with the incidence of diabetic neuropathy, and not just painful, I will come on to painful diabetic neuropathy as a separate cohort next, but all neuropathies are associated with insulin resistance, as, a, as they are with smoking, alcohol use, which is perhaps not surprising, increased height, which is surprising, but I suspect reflects the fact that your peripheral nerves are longer if you're taller. This is simply a function of length, and taller people are therefore more susceptible to damage to longer nerves. And of course, older age, which simply reflects exposure to risk over time. And the risk factors for pain in the context of diabetic neuropathy are additional female sex. So women are more likely to have a painful diabetic neuropathy than men with diabetes. A more severe underlying neuropathy is more likely to become painful. Higher HbA1c is independently associated with additional pain, as is kidney failure, renal impairment, and a higher BMI. So there's huge overlap here in some ways with the previous two talks when we're thinking about glycemia, renal impairment, management of obesity and hypertension and the features of, cardio, of the insulin resistance syndrome. But really here we're focusing on whether or not that can help us to prevent the incidence of painful diabetic neuropathy. There are some underlying potential genes that have been implicated in the incidence of painful diabetic neuropathy, and the two that come up repeatedly are the ACE gene and the MTHFR gene, which is uh, methyl NT, I can't say it, sorry, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. And of course, that's associated with folate metabolism, and we know that folic acid and folate deficiency is associated with neuropathy in people with and without diabetes. So why do people living with diabetes develop neuropathy? So this is adapted from a fantastic review that looks at the microvascular pathophysiology of complications and what happens inside the cell in all tissues in response to hyperglycemia. So elevated glucose pushes glucose down the glycolysis pathway and increases the intracellular concentration of diacylglycerol. That, in turn, stimulates increased protein kinase C within the cell, which has a cascade increasing and changing the concentrations of other intracellular and extracellular chemokines and cytokines. So we have increased endothelin-1 and decreased nitric oxide synthase, which changes local blood flow. We have increased vascular growth factors, which changes vascular permeability and angi angiogenesis, and increasing uh, growth factor beta, which causes capillary occlusion. So we're starting to see uh, leaky, occluded, very small vessels in tissues with abnormal blood flow. We then see vascular occlusion, occlusion from PAI1, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, which causes intravascular clot within these very small vessels, and NF-kappa beta causes pro-inflammatory gene expression, so we make more cytokines locally. And finally, we have more oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species from NADPH and NADH oxidases. And all of this taken together gives us a very inflamed local area with decreased altered blood flow occluded very small capillary, and we have local tissue damage. And of course, in the case of neuropathy, that is not recoverable. Peripheral nerves are, are very poor at recovering and regrowing. I should say, though, that what we see sometimes as neuropathy is not just neuropathy that is irreversible, but there is also hyperglycemia neuritis, which can similarly be pain, paresthesia, anesthesia, and can be very distressing. And we will all have seen people at new diagnosis of diabetes with very high glucose and neuropathic symptoms that resolve on treatment of glucose. And I'll come back to some data on that. So if this is the mechanism intracellularly and is dependent partly on glucose inside the cell, 
Can intensive glycemic control reduce the incidence of neuropathy? The answer is yes in type 1 diabetes. These are data from the GCCT, uh, the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial, which randomized people living with type 1 diabetes, adults living with type 1 diabetes, to intensive glucose control with insulin or standard glucose control with insulin. And as you all know, the results were very clear that intensive control reduces the incidence of microvascular complications. And on this slide, the neuropathy line is green, and you can see that for any lowering of HbA1c from 12 down to 6, there is a reduced relative risk of the incidence of diabetic neuropathy. Along with that, there are significant reductions in retinopathy and kidney disease, but we're really focusing here on neuropathy. So for people living with type 1 diabetes, glycemic management is critical to preventing the incidence of diabetic neuropathy. When we look uh, at diagnosis, as I said earlier, uh, and as you will all know, diagnosis of diabetic neuropathy is really dependent on history and examination. So you'll all have done pinprick and temperature sensation, and when we do pet temperature sensation, it's mostly cold sensation that changes first. Loss of heat sensation is much later in diabetic neuropathy. Vibration sensation and proprioception are important, and one of the very early losses in diabetic neuropathy is that the ankle reflex will disappear. There are, of course, validated scores and questionnaires and, and much more advanced nerve conduction studies and other more invasive investigations, such as tissue nerve biopsy, that we can do to diagnose diabetic neuropathy, but we rely on our clinical expertise by taking a good history and peripheral nerve examination to make the diagnosis. Really importantly, when we make the diagnosis in the diabetes clinic, we need to think about what the differential diagnoses are that might be associated or might be important for people living with diabetes. As I said earlier, alcohol is very important, and alcohol can be a unifying diagnosis for diabetes and a neuropathy in the case of pancreatic disease. Amyloidosis, while rare, is an important cause of both diabetes uh, and peripheral neuropathy, uh, and I can think of one patient that I have in my clinic who has a hereditary amyloid, Vitamin B12 deficiency, whether it's autoimmune in the case of pernicious anemia or related to metformin use is obviously very important for people living with diabetes, uh, as is checking thyroid function tests and the other things that you might do for a standard peripheral neuropathy screen. So I've already shown you that the association of, a, a, of glycemia and neuropathy is well described in people living with type 1 diabetes. And here are some slightly different data, again, from the DCCT EDIC study. The EDIC was the long-term follow-up from the DCCT. And you can see very clearly that for each increase in HbA1c of 1%, there is a significant relative risk of increasing clinically evident diabetic peripheral neuropathy, abnormal nerve conduction studies, and confirmed diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And that's both prevalent and incident cases in both of those cohorts. So it's very clear that there's a very uh, well-established relationship between increasing HbA1c and prevalent and incident disease in people living with type 1 diabetes. And for all of the other reasons that we already have for glycemic management, glycemic management is uh, critical in people living with type 1 diabetes. It's much less clear, slightly surprisingly, in people living with type 2 diabetes. There are less data, uh, and most of the three or four studies that we have are observational and small. We think that there may be improved nerve conduction with intensive insulin treatment, and there are two series from Japan that show improved large fiber and small fiber neuropathy with uh, resolution of HbA1c to non-diabetes ranges. And as I said earlier, this is taking people at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes with an HbA1c well above target, and intensively treating to an HbA1c below 6.5%, and showing resolution and improvement of large fiber and small fiber nerve conduction study metrics. Whether that reflects improvement in neuritis rather than neuropathy uh, is unclear, and whether that means that longer term people will have fewer symptoms and less clinically apparent neuropathy is also unclear. 
I'm not arguing in any way that people with type 2 diabetes should not have intensive control of glucose. Uh, I think that is probably a debate for another day. Uh, but I think that if we think that glycemia is important for any other reason, it is also likely to be important to prevent the incidence of neuropathy for people living with type 2 diabetes. Really importantly, and echoing data about physical activity that we heard earlier, lifestyle is very important for people living with neuropathy. These are two, uh, two separate studies. The one on the left shows the impact of exercise on nerve conduction velocity, and you can see in the control group over time that nerve conduction velocity slightly fell while it improved in the exercise group for both motor and the sensory nerve component, and the sensory nerve component was a greater effect size. On the right is the Michigan Neuropathy Screening Instrument questionnaire results before and after a structured exercise program for people living with diabetes and neuropathy. And again, you can show in a small sample that, what, uh, that there was an improvement in overall reported well-being, and those are total symptom scores. So exercise, again, important for everything else that we talk about in type 2 diabetes. But it, where it may be very limited by neuropathy, so people with neuropathy will often say that walking is painful, that activity is difficult and challenging, what we need to try to do is actively encourage, enable, and support people living with neuropathy to undertake as much exercise as they possibly can, as that is likely to be helpful for, for their neuropathy, as well as for all of the other domains of living with type 2 diabetes. But these things are not necessarily going to prevent all of the symptoms. And if we have someone who has confirmed diabetic neuropathic pain, what should we treat them with and how do we approach this? So once we've made the diagnosis clinically in our clinic and we've excluded any other reversible causes uh, and thought about what we might do, what we can think about then is what our first line treatments are. I would suggest avoiding opiates while possible, though there are some data that support the use of tramadol. The reason for avoiding opiates is that they have some adverse effects that you're all familiar with, and of course the association with addiction may be problematic later. We then have three different classes of drug that we can use, and as I said, these are orphaned from other indications and are borrowed for the indication of neuropathic pain. We have anticonvulsants, principally the two agents that act on the GABA receptor centrally. We have SNRIs, selective noradrenaline uh, reuptake inhibitors, we have tricyclic antidepressants, and of course we can think about combinations of those, but that can be limited by side effects. So if we think about those in order, so in terms of anticonvulsants, we have gabapentin and pregabalin. My personal preference is to use pregabalin. It's safe in renal impairment. It's taken less frequently than gabapentin. It needs less titration than gabapentin, uh, and I find it to be effective. Gabapentin is slightly older uh, and can be less expensive, but really needs intensive titration and is taken three times daily. We often see uh, in our clinics people who have been started on gabapentin at the lowest dose and have never been up titrated and remain symptomatic or simply stop taking the tablet regularly, so lose the benefit of potentially gabapentin and having a reduction in their symptom score. In terms of the serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, we have duloxetine and venlafaxine. These have slightly different biases. So venlafaxine is very frequently used as a pure antidepressant, and if we have somebody who has mood, uh, a mood component to their neuropathy, which is of course common, venlafaxine may be your preferred agent. Duloxetine has been more frequently studied in the context of a painful diabetic neuropathy, but for both of these, there is a potential additional benefit to both mood and quality of life, though these agents do have more side effects than anticonvulsants, such as dizziness and headaches. Uh, so again, we need to be careful with doses and titrate slowly. The other thing with all of these agents, it's really important to say to patients, is that they won't work immediately. This is not taking paracetamol for a headache. This is for neuropathic pain. And I always say to all of my patients, you will need to take this for at least two weeks before you see any benefit. Hopefully I'm wrong when I say that, but I'm trying to manage expectation that they should persevere despite not perceiving an improvement immediately. 
And then finally, we have the tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, desipramine, and imipramine. And I frequently use these at night where people have troublesome burning pains, temperature pains, and feelings while they're trying to sleep. They can be really helpful, particularly in combination with the anticonvulsants. So pregabalin in the, during the day, amitriptyline in a small dose at night, both help sleep uh, and to help with symptoms overnight. Finally, we have alpha-lipoic alpha acid, or rather, we don't have alpha-lipoic acid. We don't use it in the United Kingdom. It's not available as a pharmaceutical preparation, uh, and it's not licensed, though it is safe and well-tolerated with uncertain efficacy. While I was writing this talk, I found several systematic reviews, and really surprisingly for systematic reviews, they all disagree, which makes me think that the data must be really heterogeneous and difficult to interpret. But uh, I've selected one meta-analysis plot there that shows that there is a significant weight of evidence that suggests that alpha-lipoic acid can be beneficial symptoms of diabetic neuropathic pain and really importantly none of the systematic reviews and none of the data suggest it is anything other than safe and well tolerated so if it's available and if you're unable to treat pain without it it may be an adjunct that you can try and finally pharmacologically there's capsaicin cream uh, so the NICE guidance is very, very cagey about using capsaicin and says consider capsaicin cream for people with localized neuropathic pain who wish to avoid or who cannot tolerate oral treatments. I have rarely seen it used and have rarely seen benefit. It's expensive. It can be very difficult to apply because the very high, um, the high strength capsaicin cream, you need to wear rubber gloves to put it on. You need to avoid touching other people. It's a, it's a difficult cream to use, um, but it is there for very localized patches of severe neuropathic pain that are not responsive to other agents. And finally, there's non-pharmacological agents. So spinal cord stimulators are available. Uh, this is what they look like. So you have a, a battery-powered stimulator that sits behind the pelvic bone uh, with electrodes that are implanted dorsally along, along the spine, and they are potentially effective. They are, as you'd expect, expensive, and they are invasive, and they lack high-quality evidence. But for people with intractable pain that is really severe and doesn't respond to any pharmacology, they may be an option. Um, and finally, in the last minute or two before you get your tea, which I'm sure you're waiting for, I'll tell you a story about, about the multidisciplinary approach. Uh, my brother-in-law, uh, so my wife's, hus my wife's brother, my wife's husband is me, um, my wife's brother, I need tea, um, my wife's brother is an anaesthetist in Oxford, and he runs a pain service. Uh, and he says that when people come and see him for, for pain, and it's not just diabetes, but for any pain, he says he has a filing cabinet alongside his desk, and he has a few drawers, and when he talks to them, he opens his drawers and says, I have some tablets for you, they might work. Then he closes that drawer, and he opens the next drawer, and he says, I have some creams, and they might work. He closes that drawer, and he opens the third drawer, and he says, I've got some injections, we can inject in the spine and do some implants. And then he closes that drawer, and then he reaches the bottom drawer, and he says, and I've also got some psychology, and we can help you and help you to live with your pain. And I think that's really important. This is not just a pharmacological problem. We should, of course, be encouraging glycemic management and exercise, but this is also a well-being and a quality of life issue. And in your multidisciplinary team, when you're thinking about diabetic neuropathic pain, you will be prescribing, your educator and your nurse will be supporting self-care and self-management, You'll have foot surveillance to ensure that there's no increase or changing risk of ulceration or charco. You'll have podiatry to address those problems if they arise. But it's really important to think about how you support people's well-being and think about their psychology. So I will summarize there. Diabetic neuropathy is common, and it's at least 50% of all, all neuropathy that we see. Painful neuropathy is commoner in women, those with longest duration diabetes, higher HbA1c, obesity, and renal impairment. Intensive glucose management is definitely key for type 1 diabetes and is important in type 2 diabetes, but its impact on neuropathy is unclear. I would encourage exercise and activity as much as you can, and I know it's challenging, and treatment with anticonvulsants, SNRIs, and TCAs 
possibly in combination, is the mainstay. Consider capsaicin cream, but it can be challenging. Obviously, the key here is to prevent foot ulceration, and please consider the impact of chronic pain on people's well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alika. Um, we could take maybe one question, one or two questions from the audience, please. What is my experience with alpha-lipoic acid? Absolutely nothing, sir. Um, we really don't have it available in the United Kingdom. It's not a licensed medicine, and it's very challenging for us to, to get hold of it. We can suggest it to people, and they can try to source it themselves, but we're unable to prescribe or, 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 or use it. I'd be really interested to see a well-designed, randomized control trial, because it, it clearly has some benefit. But, but I showed you that meta-analysis. There are lots of studies but they're all really small, really difficult to interpret, often funded by people with an interest in what the results might be. Um, and I, and I, don't, I honestly don't have a clear idea of what the impact might be. Mechanistically, it's biologically plausible that it would be effective. Um, and I think if people are not managing with conventional pathways, then I think it's, it's certainly safe and well tolerated and worth a try. Um, but I don't have any personal experience to share, I'm afraid. Right. Thank you then. Thank you very much.